Welcome to Thinking Green. I am Rana, and um, as I'm sure you all know, Election Day is exactly two weeks away, November 6th. The last day to register to vote routinely is October 30th. Uh, you can go into the registrar's office. Uh, you can register online at the Secretary of State uh, website. And you can mail it in, a, a, and I think as long as it's postmarked by the 30th, you're OK. If you turn 18 or move to a new place between uh, November 1st and Election Day, you can still register. And uh, we do also have Election Day registration in Connecticut, uh, which maybe we'll talk about in, in detail uh, a little bit farther on in the show. So in keeping with the uh, series we've been doing with uh, various Green Party candidates, tonight's guests are Brian Gay, who is running for Registrar of Voters in East Hampton, Connecticut. And joining us uh, also is Doug Larry. And Doug was, I think, the very first Green Party candidate for Registrar of Voters uh, in Wyndham in 2012, I believe. Yes. And so he currently works as a regional election monitor in the Northeast region. And um, so we'll be talking a lot about voting elections, what the Registrar of Voters does, and why it's a good idea to get the Green Party into that. So welcome, Brian. <laughs> welcome, you. Doug. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Brian, and ask you, like, how did you originally get involved in Political activists, uh, uh, political activism, or Green Party politics. Yeah, sure. So, um, starting with for the Green Party, at least it was in 2012. Um, I had just uh, come out recently in about 2009, and was just finishing up school in Providence, Rhode Island. And it was the 2012 presidential election, and I found myself very frustrated with the two major parties um, because I found that neither one really represented what I you know, believed in, and especially as a queer person, there wasn't much representation in either party at that time, uh, or support policy-wise. So I don't remember how I came across uh, Dr. Jill Stein, but learned about her campaign, and then um, went to one of her rallies in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, became a fan, and then started to follow her campaign, voted green in 2012, and then uh, shortly thereafter registered, I moved back to Massachusetts, registered in the Green Rainbow Party in Massachusetts, and then relocated to Connecticut uh, about three years ago when I got involved uh, more heavily in the Green Party of Connecticut, so. And was that really your first for foray into like po political action, or had you been working like in gay rights issues or before that? No, so before that, so my family uh, had been involved in local politics to a certain extent. So my mother um, was involved in uh, town politics in the town that I grew up in, in Massachusetts. So uh, there was some background there. Uh, I've heard stories about my grandparents, <laughs> um, my Nana in particular, who was involved. Um, they were both very staunch Democrats from the um, Depression era. And so, uh, you know, we're involved in labor rights and um, protesting. Actually, George Wallace came to the town that I grew up in when I was wow. in high school. And so they were involved in protesting uh, when he was there, uh, trying to, you know, pretty much make a stand in opposition to the anti-civil rights movement, which was happening at the time, and which had a foothold in the town that I was from in Massachusetts, too. And, and it was the Democratic Party down there that was you know, at the forefront of that anti-civil rights movement. Dixie Crest. Yeah, and it, which is interesting, and I think that there was a conflict between that, you know, yeah. contingent within the Democratic Party, but then also the values that, um, that my mother's family had, and so that uh, created conflict, and so they stood up for what they saw as human rights and civil rights, which they supported. So there was some background like that in the family, and then when I went to school, I took uh, intro to poli sci, which introduced me to feminism, and um, uh, that was kind of my first exposure to that. And also environmentalism was in that class. I got involved in the uh, environmental group on campus, the student group. Um, I had been involved, my uh, family was also involved in the pro-life movement when I was younger, um, so I had been exposed to going and hearing testimony and going to marches uh, for that movement, which may be interesting to some people as a current yeah. Green. 
Um, but there was the perspective, again, uh, from the values that my family had, that it was standing up for people uh, and for their rights and trying to represent people who are underrepresented, which then ended up uh, transferring over to the other movements that I learned about, like the women's rights movement, um, the queer LGBT movement, and of course the environmental movement as well. So I also, when I was in college, got some exposure to um, socialism and so started to learn a little bit about that and how it's related to LGBT issues. And um, so kind of begrudgingly at first, but then as I learned more about it, uh, kind of appreciated what it has to offer. And so um, that informed me as well. I saw a great quote just today, something like, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of us who, who get into politics sort of grudgingly do it for that reason. It's going to happen whether we're involved or not. And if we're you know, not involved, uh, we're more likely to be victimized by it. Mm -hmm. Now, Doug, uh, going back to 2012, what made you decide to run for Registrar of Voters? It, it hadn't been done yet in Connecticut. Um, I had been working in the Fortune 500 to about 2007 and then sort of outsourced, globalized, and pushed further away from money uh, to about 2010. Um, a friend of mine was running for an important office in my town, Jean Dismay, um, ha was our first green uh, chief executive officer in the state. Uh, she was the last first select woman. Um, and as I helped her with her campaign for 2009, I realized the quality of the data could use improvement that when we sent out a mailing, a third or more would come back, that the addresses might be legally appropriate, but incomplete. Um, the zip four might be wrong. The apartment numbers were often missing. They were sometimes juxtaposed, uh, juxtaposition, um, dyslexic, 17, 71. They were undeliverable. And so I spent a lot of the rest of the campaign working on data quality. And then gradually I had more opportunities to work with the Registrar of Voters on things like legislative districts after the census of 2010, uh, and where will our polling station be, and how many people show up for elections, and therefore how many parking spaces do I need per hour? <laughs> and, yeah. and that sort of analytical approach to, this is a, a process for electing our leaders, but it's also a process for people being heard. And I was concerned that you couldn't get a bus into one of the polling stations, that some of the polling stations didn't have enough parking spaces for people to feel welcome. Um, and so I got into it from a, oh, there's great data here. And, and as a data guy, I, I felt I could be useful. Now, uh, Registrar of Voters, uh, for people who live in New London, this idea <laughs> of, uh, of having a third party <laughs> Registrar of Voters is just a foreign concept. We, I think we are the only town in the state where we do not elect registrars of voters. The Democrats <laughs> appoint one, the Republicans appoint one. There's no election, there's no possibility of getting it beyond uh, an office of, of representing those two parties. So what I'd like to talk about, I think, is what is the value of having a registrar of voters in town who isn't a Democrat and is, isn't a Republican. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would say that I think uh, something that's important to remember is that over 60% of voters, uh, I, th I think that's nationwide, but also in Connecticut, and a majority of voters in my town that I'm from, East Hampton as well, are unaffiliated. They're not a Democrat, they're not a Republican. So I think it's important that, you know, given the fact that the majority of voters aren't even members of those two parties, to have those two parties controlling the whole process, I think is questionable. And I think it's only reasonable to have uh, someone who's not a member of the two parties, who's a member of that third group of people who are either unaffiliated or of a minor party like the Green Party, to be able to participate in that process. Um, you know, it's an independent view lens to view it through. I think I'd be uh, impartial, and so far as I'm not tied to the two power-holding parties in the town, um, 
So I think that would be helpful. And I actually did this afternoon look at the East Hampton numbers, not for, not real recent from 2012. Mm -hmm. And it is pretty much 50-50, very close to that. Half of the uh, registered voters in your town are Democrats or Republicans. The oh. other half <laughs> are something else, either okay. unaffiliated mm -hmm. or, or minor party members. And Although I, I know the registrars will always say once they're in the job, they behave in a nonpartisan way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that may be true, but is not guaranteed to be true. Mm -hmm. Well, during business hours. It's true. <laughs> yes, you know, when they're working for the public, generally speaking, they try to behave in a nonpartisan fashion. Uh, but some of them will slip and behave in a bipartisan fashion. Which isn't quite the same. No. Well, I, I heard something kind of frightening. Uh, people might know that Fred Link uh, recently tried to get on the ballot to run for U.S. Senate mm -hmm. a, as a socialist action candidate. He did not succeed. And in one city, when they looked at um, what had happened with the signatures, unaffiliated uh, registered voters' signatures were not counted. They were thrown out. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know, I won't even say it's malicious. I think that they're kind of myopic or biopic <laughs> if, it's, uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it's a registrar who's a Democrat and Republican. They don't even think about you know, the half of the voters that aren't one or the other. Mm -hmm. So, so well, and they've been doing petitions for primaries, and the primaries are solely of those two large parties in our state. That's true. And so they've been staring at pages for weeks that were you were one party or you were the other mm -hmm. party, and then they get petitions from you know, some other candidate who isn't a member of those two large parties, and they might naturally stay in the vein of wrong party, wrong party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No party at all. Oh my yeah. gosh. It doesn't yeah. necessarily yeah. have to be malicious for us to fix it. Doesn't have to be malicious. Oh right. No, and I wouldn't. It I wouldn't argue that. It does appear that yeah. quite town. a few signatures got ignored that were unaffiliated. So and and, and there just isn't that knowledge base. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that running as a green for registrar of voters. It's not that easy to get elected, but it is possible. So maybe you can explain how could you could become a registrar. Sure. So uh, per Connecticut statute, as I understand it, so jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but from what I've researched and what I've found and what other people have shared information with me, like Doug, who's a wealth of information, um, is that Connecticut mandates that each town, and it gets into more intric intricate detail, but essentially each town's mandated to have a Democrat and a Republican registrar. That's mandatory, They're, they have to have those two. And then if someone else from a minor party or, or an unaffiliated individual decides to run, they would have to score more than either the Democrat or the Republican in order to then get office. So if you come in second place or first place, you'd be a third registrar. Correct, yes. And what's also, what I, the point that I made in a letter to the editor of um, the newspaper of the town that I live in, in East Hampton, was that you know you can vote for the, in, like me, or vote for someone who's unaffiliated or a minor party, and it doesn't hurt the Democrat or Republican, because even if they get zero votes, they still They'll get, get the position. Yeah, yeah, they still get it. So. If they don't run, they can still be appointed, because the office must be filled by a person from each of the two largest parties. It doesn't explicitly say this party and that party, but the two largest, and for quite some time, that's been yeah. those two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, so, uh, so there is a possibility, and it seems as though voter education would do a, go a long way towards helping third registrars get in. Well, yeah. and it's happened. Uh, Hartford had a third registrar. That's uh, true. The Working Families Party managed to elect a person in 2008, I believe, and again in 2012. And then they changed the system. Well, the, lots of things happened. <laughs> but um, basically, she got more votes than the Republican. Uh, Hartford's a huge city. Its Republican voter base is small, and its Democratic voter base is huge. And the Working Families Party ran a, a fairly qualified candidate, I might add, not just a wannabe. Um, mm -hmm. And she uh, won twice. 
um, and, and did fairly well. Um, so that was an example of a third party uh, coming in second, uh, more than once. And we seek to do it again. Uh, races have occurred with Greens coming in third place, of course, out of three. Um, I came in about mid-teens, 15 or so percent. Uh, another candidate in my town did. And the Republicans were getting in the mid to low 20s. So it wasn't like we were a distant shot, just not quite enough to be in second. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there are two things. One, people don't understand that a vote for you is not a vote against the Republican or no. Democratic candidates. Correct. And there are some people who worry, oh, will it cost my town more to have three registrars? Yes, and that was a specific concern that was raised in my town oh, um, yeah. by one of the two registrar <laughs> candidates, maybe both of them, but I only heard about it from one of them. Um, and that the, the issue being, we can't afford this right now, my town is in a budget crisis. We've had four elections or four referendum referenda so far this year trying to pass a municipal budget. We have a municipal budget and then an education budget, and the two sides can't agree on what's going to happen with that. So they've had four referenda, and each time it keeps failing by more and more people. That costs more than you do. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, the cost of a referendum, referendum is quite high. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. See, I you know, a few thousand. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, that's you know, a good point to make then. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, because they... And, of course, if there is a budget for voting processes, election workers, shall we say, and you happen to be one of them, that doesn't necessarily mean the budget needs to be a lot higher. For instance, other workers who've been hired in the past might work less. Mm -hmm. um, deputies might work less. Uh, assistant registrars might work less. Any clerical staff might work less. Uh, even moderators might work less. If you were to be elected as registrar, it simply means there's one more person with this title. The budget doesn't necessarily need to change. And in some towns, that might even be appreciated. Some towns have registrars who have been pushed to their capacity. Their other jobs are in danger. Um, in, in Sterling, for instance, one of the uh, registrars was told, come back to work. You, you've taken too many days off. Oh, okay. You know, so in some towns, it could be a blessing. Oh, yeah, and I think, I think in our town, especially with the budget constraints and the fact that the current at least one of the current registrars has been very vocal about how much they've been working and how much of a burden it is in terms of the extra hours they have to put in and coordinating all of these special elections or referenda rather. Um, so the way I see it, it's an extra set of hands for, it's three for the price of two. You get you know, three registrars you for the same price as two and extra well, hands. At the and pot. it's a lumpy business. You have a lot of work to do in narrow time periods. More hands for those narrow time periods is useful. And then we can all take a break during the other times or keep the office open a little more whichever they decide. Mm -hmm. It depends on the service level desired, but more people means you can handle the, the spikes. Elections are not a small task. No, mm -hmm. when they're, they're major. So on the campaign trail, uh, what have your experiences been? Yeah, so <laughs> it's so it's been uh, pretty digital so far. So <laughs> um, I, you know, a, a good portion of the time. Actually, it's helpful to go over process a little bit. So just to initially get on the ballot, involved uh, first, you had to submit an application to petition because as a minor party right. candidate, you don't, you know, Democrats and Republicans can uh, go through their party structures, I believe, to be able yeah. to seek yeah. the position. Yeah, and every line is kind of automatically theirs. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> And so for, for me to be able to even run for registrar voters in East Hampton, I had to first submit an application to the Secretary of State's office. Uh, David Bedell, who's another Green uh, in the state party, helped me with that process, showed me the paperwork I needed to fill out, where the signatures were needed, what specifically needed to go where, and then who to give it to, which is the town clerk. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave it to them. Um, but then I think also it's important for the towns to get uh, some additional education on how minor parties play a role in the system because our town clerk very helpful when I went in I was excited to see that I was trying to go for the office um, but when it came time to then submit the paperwork to Secretary of State's office uh, there was an issue with it not getting received by the deadline they, they s sent it in on time but they didn't send in all the pages they only sent in one page of the packet oh. so it was initially a problem Secretary of State ended up accepting it so it was fine um, but, but it could have not been fine. Right, yeah, so. There were a couple of nervous days there, if I recall. Yeah, and that wasn't the first, because that happened with that, and then 
later on, so after I applied, that was to apply just for the petitioning paperwork, to then be able to ask for neighbors to sign off and uh, you know essentially approve of my going for the office. So I collected the necessary number of signatures, handed that into the town clerk's office, and then um, with that case, it got sent into the Secretary of State's office, and then I received word, uh, it was right around the primary time, so it was a few weeks later or about a month later, in sometime in late August, that um, unfortunately I didn't make the cut because I hadn't collected enough signatures. And so I was confused because we had ran the numbers as to how many signatures I would need. And so I checked, I think with you, Doug, mm -hmm. and with David, and was just like, okay, did we not need 1%? Because that was my understanding. And then what it turned out was that the Secretary of State's office had actually, um, I think, miscalculated it. And so I sent them the percentage it, it, that was needed. It's enough error, but it yeah. was, Tough on the candidate who was told, you're not on the ballot, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Yeah, that was after young. it's too but late essentially to they had compared it to 10% instead of one. A simple enough error, uh, ordinary math error, mm -hmm. but uh, devastating for a candidate. And had he not had support from other people who were familiar with the process, he might have easily been discouraged from running and not realized this was a simple, correctable error. Absolutely, yeah. And that points to the fact that um, it's kind of useful in towns to have a Green Party presence because uh, the registrars and the clerks don't really know the rules if we're not there to tell them the rules. <laughs> or teach them. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, you know, New London has had a town committee now for a decade, since 2008. And state law says that whenever the chair of the Democratic town committee and the chair of the Republican town committee receive any kind of notification, the chair of the Green Town Committee has to get it too. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. three years ago, we were not notified about something. And uh, we did complain to the State Election Enforcement Commission. Um, and we were correct. Nothing really happened to the re registrars, which was fine. I didn't really, I didn't want them to get fined or lose their job. I went in there afterwards and said, I felt bad, but we've been around for a long time, you can't forget us. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I, and, and they won't forget us now. And you know, but they don't know this stuff automatically until you're there and present. Mm -hmm. um, they really don't know what their obligations are. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking the 10% is because there were a lot of primary elect, uh, primaries mm -hmm. forced in the major parties. Mm -hmm. And for those primaries, they do need to get 10% of the uh, people registered in their party. Yeah, which is a, a very high threshold. We, we complain as minor parties, but imagine trying to get 10% yeah, of the Democrats in your town. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a much that's tougher petitioning yeah. effort. Uh, okay. yeah. That's a yeah. huge requirement. It, yeah, it, it, it is a really big you know, requirement. So it's basically designed to make it, we pick who's going to be on the ballot. And if you want a primary, we're going to give you a tough time on it. So, but yeah, it's, it's very confusing, and you know, I think some of the confusion goes all the way up to the legislature and the Secretary of State's office. So, mm -hmm. if I can make a plug, we have Green Party candidates, you know, for Secretary of State and mm -hmm. for you know, for, for state Attorney assembly, General. and uh, some of those rules I, I think are very confusing for the registrars and for the clerks that. This kind of petitioning has this kind of threshold and this kind of requirement and that mm -hmm. kind of petitioning has something else. It, it really is confusing and my opinion is that having a Green Party member in the office would be a, a huge resource for, for these towns. I, I think so too and I think that not only for Greens and I think that's important for people to know too is that registrars don't do policy right. work. They don't, we're not, yeah. we're not instituting our green agenda, you right. know, <laughs> as much as I would love that and that would be great, yeah. I would have no ability right. to do that as a registrar. We simply enact, uh, as I understand it, whatever the policies are from the Secretary of State's office, we help to implement elections, it, we help to process, process paperwork. Oriented. Yeah, so uh, there's no, you know, it's not like it's going to be just for Greens uh, if I were to receive the office. All, maybe yeah. six of them that are in my town that are, you know, registered Greens, but it would be hopefully helpful for other people who may want to get elected or uh, run for office to learn what the process is um, from whatever party they're of. If they don't have that system in place that the Democrats and Republicans have to kind of 
help them through the entire process. Yeah, and that's true, I think, of unaffiliated people, too, because I think more and more we're seeing people who are quite involved in politics who don't really want to attach themselves to a party. Or mm -hmm. only do briefly for the primaries. Yeah, and so you right. wind up with these in-name-only uh, Democrats or in-name-only yeah, uh, Republicans. For 72 hours. Uh, for, <laughs> well, for 90 days. You have, to, you have to become a Democrat way back in January to vote in an April primary, as so many learned in 2016. We okay. lost a quarter of the Green Party for that process, and it's just a whole lot of work for everybody. It's rather unnecessary. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine yeah. trying to shift hundreds of voters back and forth with the season, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. open primaries might be something to talk to our legislators about. <laughs> well, well, sure, it might even benefit them. Yeah, it could. You know, if anyone who well, was... Th we, the voters, are out there, and we're larger than either of the parties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you want to know how you're going to do in the general election, you, you might want to listen to us during the primary. And open primaries would make it so that anyone from well, yeah, just I, any citizen could mm -hmm. vote in the primary? Yeah, you, you could choose a primary. party. Oh, okay. Each state does it differently, but some states do it. You show up and you pick a ballot. So, oh, okay. you know, do you have an opinion over here or do you have an opinion over there? Uh, you could, of course, do it so that each was a separate race and everybody votes in that primary and everybody votes in that primary. Or you could give up primaries altogether, just do ranked choice voting and save all that money for that whole big campaign for primary, mm -hmm. which in many elections is where the decision is made. If you're in a yeah. town that is three quarters Democrat, the primary is where the decision is made sure. for who you're going to have represent you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you're not even allowed to vote. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you see my point? <laughs> yeah. All yeah. those unaffiliated voters are not really directly connected to how the representation for the area gets done yeah. mm -hmm. if they can't participate in the primary, which essentially selects who's on the ballot and thus who's going to be elected from a major party. Okay, yeah. And, and, and I noticed, you know, in East Hampton, it's more even than either in Wyndham or in New London. Mm -hmm. In our right towns, size. in Rural our towns, towns to really, the, 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 the mm -hmm. Democratic primary is often the election. Yep. Okay. And, you know, there, there's often not even a Republican opponent mm -hmm. once the Democratic primary is finished, or if there is, it's just a token or, or a placeholder uh, candidate. So it, it, it's really hard. It, it actually took me a long time to decide to register Green, even though I was involved with the Green Party for several years, because I didn't want to give up that voting in the primary. Okay. And then I just so, decided, so uh, If you think <laughs> about it, uh, about 52%, 54% of our Connecticut voters are affiliated with one of these two major parties. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those are solely because of the primary. Were it not for the primary, they'd be unaffiliated or perhaps they'd be some minor party that better represents their point of view. And so we've essentially got two large parties that are a little bit fluffed up with people who are there for only the influence of the primary. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't help them much, and it probably doesn't yeah. help us much. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are s what, six parties that you can register in statewide, uh, and not, yeah. not just two. Right. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and yet only two are on the registration paperwork. So when you go to register and you see big party or other big party, yeah. as your choices, it's like, there are four others that are valid statewide. That's a good yeah. point, yeah. You know, Green, one of them, uh, the Independent Party, uh, yeah. Working Families Party, and the Libertarian Party. And they each mean well, run candidates, but you don't see them on the registration paperwork. Yeah, which to register Green in Connecticut, I think it's box 19 or box 11, do we know? Box nine, I think, but box nine, nonetheless, okay, yeah. you, you, know, you write, fill in write it other, in. Right, yes. it's a write-in, and then sometimes they can't understand what Green is and get it wrong. It's I remember amazing. hearing that too, yeah, that they have the misregistering. Well, we had 200 members of our party get registered incorrectly as not in the Green Party, and they were like some other code, GRN or something? Yeah, or GRE. GRE. And I, I actually oh. went to our Republican registrar here who was very helpful. He Good. pulled up a registration card of one of these people who was improperly registered whom I knew was a, a green. He mm -hmm. admit, this guy had been a green for a long time, had moved out of Connecticut, moved back in. So I felt mm -hmm. confident that he really intended to be green. 
And on the Secretary of State's pull-down menu where um, the registrar was entering in all, all the information about this person, there were two choices. One was green and one was green party. And <laughs> if you chose green, you got the unqualified code. Yeah. Really? And if you chose green party, you got the correct one. I have been told the Secretary of State's office has gotten rid of that extra code since then and, and made mm -hmm. the necessary repairs. Oh, I hope so, because I told yeah, them to just write this green. This happened so. a couple of years ago, <laughs> and <laughs> our local registrar, and he was a new registrar, and how would he know that he had to say green party and not green? Mm -hmm. You know, people on their, if it says what party, people are writing down green. They're not really well, writing down green. Because it's a handwritten entry, it's not terribly uniform. Some people will write green, some people yeah. will write green party. <laughs> but nobody gets disqualified for writing Democrat. Mm -hmm. Instead of Democrat. Democratic Party, yeah. you know, yeah, it's like, it was, ah! It was very, it, it was a very strange... Yeah. There uh, is, a, to give the um, professionals here some credit, there's a reason this is so murky, and that is we allow the creation of new parties on the fly. If you want to run for office and you want right. to be a member of or run on the plaid party line, mm -hmm. you can create the plaid party at the you same can. time you petition to office with an additional sheet of paperwork. Uh, okay. Uh, and so the system needs a way to support this new and upcoming party, uh, plaid or cannonball or whatever they may be. Um, and we've had interesting party names, the guilty party. The guilty party, which is a green party member who ran as a guilty party. My wife has always been interested in who is the nice party? The nice party. It seems like you really want to you know, meet these people. Yeah. <laughs> But there are about 120 party names in Connecticut, and most of them are just local. Uh, in my town, for instance, there's the bottom line. There, um, okay, in East yeah. Hampton, we have the Chatham party. Which yes, is yes. A, yes. Yeah. Part, yeah. In Willington, we have the Sentinels. And in some towns, those become ruling parties because they represent sort of the sane center or, or some yeah. other significant group that doesn't feel represented in red or blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, 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 and then there are these. The four major minor parties, major I minor. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're official, yeah. they have to have that, so much that, 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 that are, something are criteria. recognized throughout the right. state. Well, sort of um, recognized. We're not on the forums, of. and you can write in your party name and maybe not get in the right party. But, so everyone should talk to their legislators to. about getting that form well, updated. Why are there not six parties oh, on yeah, the Oh, yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely there only should. reasonable. If and we're then official. maybe other would be the, we're still waiting for you to be in the top ten. Yeah, the yeah. guilty party's not on here. But. Uh, yeah, guilty, guilty party, party has to get bigger <laughs> before we put you on the form. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it, it, there is a lot of complications here. And, oh, yeah. uh, and I, I really feel that the Democratic and Republican people who are working in this system don't really know the ins and outs of it because they haven't, until now, had to learn the ins and outs of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think having greens in the registrar's office is just so important. Um, I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned that a lot of your early activism was mm -hmm. LGBTQ rights. Yeah. And right now under the current national administration, oh. <laughs> uh, all of us are feeling very threatened, mm -hmm. but I think in particular, the LGBTQ community is feeling very threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, last it's a tough week, week. Yeah. yeah, last yeah. week, Cass Cassandra uh, Martineau, who is running for Registrar of Voters in, in Wyndham, yeah. who's a trans woman, was on the show. And th what I asked her, and what, what I'll ask you is, do you think it's important that right now uh, members of the queer community be very visible in in our communities? I would say yes, if, it, if it's safe for them to do so and they feel safe doing so, then and it, you know, it can be a real personal journey sometimes for that and it's mm -hmm. part of the whole coming out process. Um, so I think people need to do what's right for them based on their situation. But for, um, for me, I've been out for almost 10 years and I'm very comfortable doing that and I'm very happy to be visible and just honest about the fact that I'm, I identify as queer, you know, I have a male partner and um, make no bones about it, so. <laughs> and I think it's been especially hard, uh, especially this week, like you said, for the trans community, because they don't have as much um, 
political power as the gay les gays and lesbians do, mm -hmm. um, and they, people aren't as familiar with them. A lot of people know a gay person. A lot of people might know someone who's a lesbian, and we've had more visibility just over the decades. Whereas the trans community is kind of marginalized, sometimes even within the LGBT community. They say it's the LGB community, and then sometimes you remember the T because they're kind of an afterthought, and unfortunately, that's the case sometimes, and there's even discrimination within the community against oh, yeah. trans folks. So um, I think for, for any allies who are out there, now is a really important time for allies to step up because there's people who are going to be feeling vulnerable, people who are feeling really um, frightened right now because they may not be uh, protected under the law. Um, there's less protections, legal protections for trans folk than there are for uh, gays and lesbians, so I think it's really important that allies get involved and learn about it because there's a lot to learn. And people who are gay and lesbian to learn about it too because trans folks are members of our community and so as a whole queer, LGBT, ABCXYZ community, it's important that we you know, stick together, so. Now do you think it's, it, it's helpful, I, I guess one thing that, that I think has, has changed a lot since I was a teen yeah. is, uh, with so many people out, we realize that we all have family members and neighbors mm. and mm -hmm. friends. <laughs> so it, it's very personalizing mm -hmm. for, a, and makes it easy for us straight people to be allies because it's not abstract. And I, I don't know, it seems that having people in political you know, power, positions of power um, is, is a piece of that as well. Uh, um, I know Kat, one thing that Cass mentioned in terms of voting challenges mm -hmm. for trans people is um, if they change their name, mm -hmm. do they lose their right to vote? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And that would probably depend on what the policy is in their state and then federal policy too, because there's the issue. And I, I'm not as well educated on trans issues as um, yeah. other people may be but I understand that there's issues with getting the documentation updated, getting documentation to match other documentation, so that if you're going to mm -hmm. a polling place or just other, trying to take a flight someplace, it can be really, um, they really try and obstruct you by checking all your paperwork, and if it doesn't match, they can hold you up. When I lived in Rhode Island, they were trying to get the health insurance to make exceptions, because essentially, you were, if you were a, a trans woman, uh, so maybe born male, genetically male or anatomically male, and then living as a trans woman, or vice versa, rather, if you were a, a, someone born female and then living as a trans man, even if you um, still had medical needs that a woman would have, because not all trans yeah. folks get, yeah. you know, yeah. a, a yeah. full anatomical changes then they wouldn't cover it because, oh, well, no, because now you're male. Right. It's like, so well, that makes no sense. Yeah. That's not reality, yeah. yeah. So. yeah. so it can be really challenging. It's so. convenient that it saves us a few thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so then they don't have to pay for it. But So I think, well, like you said, yeah. get, having people in political power, I think, is helpful, too, and um, people who can both be allies to the community but then also people who are members of the community so that they can advocate for what's needed. No, Connecticut, I, Connecticut's yeah. in much better shape than other states here. Each of the 50 states has its own mix of election law, and, and we're not experiencing the sort of uh, serious ID and registration problems that some areas are. Um, with, gee whiz, your paperwork isn't quite right, and the hyphens aren't in the right places, and are there spaces around your hyphens in your name? Mm -hmm. some, some states are literally trying to make anybody with a complicated name difficult to register. Mm -hmm. um, in our state, mm -hmm. writing down your gender is optional on the registration form. And when you go to vote, the person who's checking you in isn't advised as to what you may or may not have mm -hmm. said then. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually have all three uh, entries, uh, M, F, and U. And it's interesting that by town, the number of U registrations varies immensely. Uh, Mansfield's like 15%. And oh, wow. in some rural towns, oh. they're like, one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like everybody's yeah. one or the other. And then in some communities, it's like, ah, I don't even fill this out. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I get tired of people asking me that question, and it doesn't even That's say optional on the form, but yeah, and, it is. And just going off of that, I, I think it's important to remember that for a lot of people, when we go to vote, 
uh, the last thing on our mind, or far from the first thing on our mind is being afraid or having to fear for going to check in. Maybe you're afraid they won't have your address right, or maybe they <laughs> yeah. won't, you yeah. know, you'll have to wait in line. Risk. Yeah, and that's <laughs> a problem. But you're not fear of being assaulted for just presenting as right. maybe in different mm -hmm. clothes than someone else thinks you should have, or speaking in a way that's different because your voice is too high. You know what I mean? So with that that yeah. whole gender issue that trans folks face, totally different. So having friendly faces at the polling places, having safe, um, you know, polling uh, places and safe uh, electoral processes for people like that, I think is essential because otherwise, why would you want to risk getting attacked to go out and vote in something that you feel it's not going to make a difference anyways? And yeah. Well, and, and this is just one of the many demographic or, or characteristics that voters might fear they will be uh, ostracized for. I mm -hmm. mean, people of color, people of other languages, mm -hmm. um, how we present or uh, who we consider our favorites. Yeah. Um, all of these are um, lifestyles and choices and characteristics, some of which we can change and some of which we can't. And but they shouldn't impact your ability to vote. Right. All of mm. that is it's useless or at the voting irre site. Relevant you know, it's relevant like, right. to our voting rights. Are you an adult? Mm -hmm. Are you an eighteen? Are you a resident? Enough. Right. Yeah, and and, and um, Connecticut is by far not the worst One state. Of the best. We are one of the very best. I mean, we have um, we're not too good in terms of our ballot design, mm. in terms of our closed primaries, but I don't think voter disenfranchisement is a big problem here, mm -hmm. um, whereas it is in many places. What was I reading? Some place was instituting Georgia a, a poll tax. Uh, so, well, they, they sometimes Alabama. called it Alabama, that. Alabama, I think, was well, asking. If they make you get a rather expensive no. ID, and the ID is expensive to get, um, that's tough. If a college student has to go get a driver's license instead, and mm -hmm. one is yeah. with their education, and one is Another eighty dollars, mm -hmm. and yeah. it lasts for six years, and they're a senior, that that's a tough buy. Yeah, and I think that it's very important to make sure our elections are secure and are valid, mm -hmm. and there's in integrity to the election. Absolutely, but the last thing we need is to be discouraging people from voting when there's already mm -hmm. a thirty percent participation rate or very right. low participation rate. We need more participation, not less participation. And so the more roadblocks we set up, the less people will participate. So yeah. we need to make it easier for people to vote, not more difficult. I know. Well, we shouldn't be choosing who wins by who can vote. Right. Right. No, so yeah. if we make it difficult for Native Americans who are out there in a reservation where there may not be streets and numbers, but instead there's a post office where you go get your stuff and then yeah. you return to the reservation. But if your state requires that your ID have a street and a number, yeah. and you live where there is no street and there is no number, you have been targeted. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. So fortunately, but, but, I, I think but, Connecticut is not so bad, but, mm -hmm. but we are seeing nationwide well, a, a big problem. By comparison, Connecticut, to its um, credit, has registration by residents. Where are you physically? Which might be as simple as the park bench mm -hmm. or under it or out behind the tree. But then separately, how do we reach you? Which can be a P.O. box, a mailing address, a mom's house where I go back after school. Um, and mm -hmm. so we have both a where do you live and a how do we reach you. And that's important uh, to uh, deal with people who are not in a house they've lived in for 30 years all the time, mm -hmm. who are snowbirds, who come and go, or go mm -hmm. to college and come back, or who don't benefit from having a steady residence, mm -hmm. but are of this town. Mm -hmm. I live in a city where some people do not have the ability to afford an apartment every year in their life. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm thinking but they deserve to vote nonetheless. Yeah. I'm thinking of people who may have addiction living maybe in and out of sober homes, partially homeless, sure. yeah. in treatment facilities. Are they not you yeah, know, they making might. sure that they're able to vote and participate mm -hmm. as well? Now, I have a ballot, um, and I want to show it. This is the East Hampton ba ballot. 
and oh, um, so you yeah. can <laughs> see where you can find Brian's guy. name. Yeah. It's got a circle around it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because That the doesn't way, count, by the way. <laughs> no, yeah. you, this is not how you vote for Brian. <laughs> yeah. You would don't have to mark. fill in the, <laughs> the, don't make that mark, or uh, fill in the bubble, which I didn't. Um, but the green candidates are on line F on this year's ballot. And um, uh, on all the state ballots, we have a candidate for Secretary of State, uh, Mike DeRosa. We have Jeff Russell, who's a candidate for US Senate. Uh, we have Peter Gosselin, who's a candidate for Attorney General. And we have Ed Heflin, who is candidate for Controller. And then in many other areas, we have other uh, candidates. In the second congressional district, uh, Michelle Louise Bicking mm -hmm. is on the ballot. Mm -hmm. In the first congressional district, uh, Tom McCormick is on the ballot. Um, and then we have a few scattered statewide people who are running for registrar of voters. Actually, this year there are quite a few. Six, I think. Alex Foster is running in Essex. John Rausch is running in Union. Um, Cassandra is running in um, Wyndham. In Wyndham. Mm -hmm. um, then there's someone running in Walker. Bri yes, <laughs> Brian <laughs> in Brian. East Hampton. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm running. In East <laughs> and we, I think the Walker, we have uh, Sherry Conley mm -hmm. running. Uh, I might have missed someone. We also have a, a few state rep and state senate We, we have uh, some writing candidate candidates. And uh, yeah, in fact, that might be something we can talk about a little bit because um, I do have here a ballot from one of these towns where um, there's only one candidate running for registrar of voters. Mm. It's the one that John is running in. Uh, it's a funny ballot, but they have a Democratic um, on this last column. Oh, well, I'm being told there's five minutes, but. There's, they, there is a Democratic candidate for registrar of voters, but not a Republican candidate. So uh, John is running as a Green Party candidate. He will have an easier time getting elected than you do, yeah. Brian, I'm yeah. sorry to say. <laughs> no, that's okay. uh, because since there isn't a Republican on the ballot, with just a handful of votes, he, you know, unless, well, I don't know if there's a write-in or not. There could be a write-in if, for but instance, a Republican had registered by this afternoon to be a um, registered write-in candidate, then they could um, mount a write-in campaign and ask 12 friends to you know, vote for them in the difficult write-in So we write hope John spot. gets more than 12 votes because uh, <laughs> we want him to get in. Well, if you've and, met John, he's a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in Deep River, actually, there's only a Republican candidate and Sean Ames is a Green Party member, but a write-in candidate. He did not go through the petitioning process, but you can mm -hmm. write him in um, by you know filling in the bubble and writing his name in at, on the Deep River ballot. Um, so in the last three minutes or so, maybe you can uh, tell people, Brian, how to get in touch with you, how they could hold signs for you at the polls or otherwise be supportive of you in these last couple of weeks of campaigning. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So I do have a Facebook page. Um, it's uh, Brian Gay for East Hampton Registrar of Voters. Um, you can probably just search for Brian Gay East Hampton and it should show up. So you can like that page. I try and put uh, information on there either about the election process, about election integrity issues. We recently had uh, an issue of uh, ballots being destroyed in our town after the election, okay. but so you can read about that on there. Um, <laughs> I'm also on Twitter at um, it's also Brian Gay for East Hampton Registrar of Voters. The handle's at B G A Y, my last name, and then more, and then often after that. Um, and then I'm also <laughs> on Instagram as well, also Brian Gay for East Hampton Registrar of Voters. So um, I'm on the three social media sites. Uh, you can send me an email, which is included on my Facebook page, to get in touch with me. I'm happy to answer any questions. And then in East Hampton itself, you can come and hold signs. It's at the middle school, um, and it's November 6th, which is in two weeks. So Yeah, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., yeah. And, and I'm going to try and have a table there as well. And I, I, we didn't really get to it, but uh, in our last minute, I want to mention that Connecticut does have Election Day registration 
If you are not registered to vote and you missed that October 30th deadline, you can go to, uh, there's one designated spot in each town. I know in New London it's City Hall. That's and common, but I think not it's necessarily the case. Then. And you can register and vote all at once. We recommend that you not arrive at five till eight in the, the evening. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> if you want to register and you have not had a chance to do it, uh, you, there is one last chance to, to exercise that right. And mm -hmm. uh, really, voting does make a difference. Absolutely. Well, election day registration as offered in Connecticut is mostly to deal with surprises and mistakes. Should something go wrong, there is one more effort you can make. But it's not a good way to register. It's a long <laughs> line, and it's a tedious process. Yeah, yeah, so it's not recommended unless you really have to. I, if you have to, bravo. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Doug, and thank you, Brian. Um, on Election Day, vote and look at all the candidates' names and look at the candidates on line F, not just A and B. Um, I'm not quite sure what our show will be next week, but we have one last space for an election-related show before we go into some other mode. So uh, we'll be in touch. Um, you can go to Brian's site and in the Green Party of Connecticut website, you can get contact info for all of our candidates. Mm -hmm. So we will see you next week. And uh, thank you, Brian. And thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Africa, we in the Africa, you defend our Missouri sana.